Okay, so lecture four, four op amps, operational amplifiers. The op amp is the queen of analog electronic components. I mean that in its fullest sense, even the chess sense. It's the, be it's the, yes. It is straight bay, bay? Is that what, is that what she goes by? Is it? Queen, the Queen Bay. <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on. So uh, the op amp is a four-port, non-linear, voltage-controlled voltage source, but it's so much more. Here are a few applications from the op amp highlight reel. This is like obstructing my justice and my view. Um, summing two signals, subtracting two signals, amplifying a signal, integrating a signal, differentiating a signal, filtering a signal, isolating two sub-circuits, generating periodic functions, for example sinusoids and square waves, and analog feedback control. Although they are nonlinear, in most applications a linear approximation is sufficiently accurate. Nice. So figure 4-9 shows the circuit symbol for the op amp. Three terminals are displayed. The inverting input, which is denoted with the uh, minus symbol. Uh, the non-inverting input, which is denoted with the plus symbol. And the output, which in this case we've labeled V-out, V-O. Um, these comprise an output, or uh, well, an output and an input port. So the input side and the output side. Um, so that's two of our four ports. Uh, however, there are two power supply ports that are typically suppressed in the circuit diagram. These uh, two power supply ports are from a differential supply, which has a positive terminal, for example, plus 12 volts and a symmetrically negative terminal, which is minus 12 volts, and then a common ground terminal. Supply provides the op amp with external power, making it an active element. So these op amps bring power from outside of the circuit. And sometimes you'll see the external power connections. Uh, there'll be these vertical lines like it might be like t plus 12 volts minus 12 volts something like that um, this is something that that uh, uh, is common to see but it turns out that we don't actually need to use in our analysis those ports for the most part um, so we typically ignore them uh, 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 but we have to know they're there because if you're going to make an op amp circuit, you got to connect power to the op amp. And uh, um, as we're going to find, if you ask the op amp to supply power above the the plus or tw plus or minus 12 volt um, supply that it's got, it's going to saturate. It's not going to be able to do it, and it's going to turn from a linear element, which we're going to approximate it to be most of the time, to a nonlinear element, which means the analysis sucks. So we try to avoid that situation um, when possible, which is most of the time uh, possible. It's, it's very rare that you're gonna operate an op amp in nonlinear mode. So, when an op amp is operating in this linear mode, it outputs a voltage, V out, that is A times the difference between its inputs, V plus and V minus. We call A the open loop gain, and it's different for every op amp, but it's usually greater than 10 to the 5. So 10 to the 5, 100,000 is the open loop gain. Let's formalize this model. So an op amp's input terminals, plus and minus, draw zero current. In other words, they have infinite input impedance. This is like the gate on the MOSFET, right? The gate on the MOSFET doesn't draw any current. Um, in the same way, the V minus and the V plus terminals don't draw any current. OK? 
Okay. Um, and, and the idea is that it doesn't need to draw any current because it's going to take all of its power from its differential supply. Okay. So that's the first part of it. Then let A be a positive real number. So that's the open loop gain. The output voltage V out is given by the product of A and the difference between V plus and V minus. The output terminal has zero impedance, so when you model it, you don't have to put like a resistor on it like you do if you have uh, uh, an output impedance. So that is our model, and it's a it's a really good model almost all the time. It's equivalent to a dependent voltage source controlled by the input voltage difference. So it's a voltage source. It supplies voltage and power from outside the circuit, right? Um, and it's controlled by a voltage that's inside the circuit, uh, which is the, the difference between V plus and V minus. Great. Um, in fact, it is also linearly dependent. So it's not just a dependent voltage source. It's a linearly dependent voltage source. So linear circuit analysis techniques can be applied. And our favorite linear circuit analysis techniques are the impedance methods, right? They help us not have to solve a differential equation. We are particularly fond of avoiding solving differential equations, I feel like, just in general. Maybe some of us love it. Who loves it out there? Be proud. There you go. Good. Good. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, okay. So the model is fairly accurate as long as the, the magnitude of the output voltage is less than the maximum power source voltage. Due to the high open loop gain, the difference in input, this is not supposed to be the word gain here, the difference in input is highly restrictive for linear operation. So if A is 100,000 and you only have 12 volts max to put out, you can't have a very big difference between V plus and V minus before you saturate that output, right? So you might think, what do you mean this is going to operate in linear mode most of the time? It seems like it's going to do just the opposite. <laughs> it's going to operate saturated most of the time because V plus and V minus, if they're even, you know, 10 microvolts different, then it's going to be nonlinear. And so we're going to address this. Uh, we're going to, we're going to um, essentially lock these two together using this, uh, this really important new concept called feedback. Okay? And it's the beginning of a, a brand new beautiful world where you, you get to know about feedback. All right. So, Cool. Um, this turns out not to be difficult to achieve, but does lead to a convenient approximation during analysis that applies most of the time, which is equation 4.5, that V plus is approximately equal to V minus. We know that if we're going to be in linear mode, that has to be true, because A is so big, right? <laughs> so uh, if V plus is approximately equal to V minus, um, note that you don't want to use equation 4.5 and this definition in the same analysis because all that's going to tell you is that V out is equal to zero and that's not true that's not that's not what the the, uh, the point of this approximation is you would either use this expression for V out uh, related to V plus and V minus or you'd use this expression okay you don't use them together that's dangerous. It's a dangerous mixture. It's like, it's like alcohol and caffeine. They're great by themselves, but when you mix them, not as good. Yeah. So that equation you have is 4.5, but in our notes it's 4.3. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I don't know why that. Oh, it's probably because there's an extra equation. It's okay. Uh, uh, just make sure that you are consistent in your own notes with it. I, I, it's because I update the notes. 
I must have added a couple of equations. Uh, this lecture, uh, it changed very slightly from the one that most of you have. I moved the figures because when I reformatted the captions, it broke everything and there was like text on top of figures. So the content of this lecture hasn't changed, it's just the formatting slightly. So something to be aware of. Okay. Um, good. So. We cannot, however, make this assumption unless, and this is, this is, this sort of goes both ways. The op amp is operating in linear mode. So in order for the op amp to operate in linear mode, you have to be, this has to be approximately true. In order for that to be approximately true, it has to be operating in linear mode. So there's that. And then the second one is the op amp is part of a circuit that connects its output via a wire or circuit elements back to its inverting input. Okay. The second condition is called negative feedback and is used in most op amp circuits for several reasons, the most important of which is that equation 4, 5, or this V plus is approximately equal to V minus equation, holds due to the virtual guarantee of linear operation in this case. So when you, when you loop that output back to the inverting input, um, it does amazing things okay and so it's it's something that's a little bit unintuitive at first but it, it opens up a brand new world for us and actually the people who invented this my understanding I don't know the, uh, the history super well but my understanding is it was some people at Bell Labs maybe like 80 years ago and they came up with this idea and um, they published a paper and I guess they were like ridiculed like this is crazy this is like, you're going to just take the output and put it back in the input. What are you talking about? This, what good is that going to do? Anything. Um, it turns out it does a lot of good. Uh, and, and it opened up a whole new world of feedback control. Okay. And we're going to kind of explore feedback control. Also, linear amplifiers. Because notice the, the amplification that we got out of the last, uh, uh, out of the MOSFET circuits, which is still useful, is very much nonlinear, right? This one gives you really nice linear amplification. And uh, uh, it was not obvious until somebody explained it. And then it was still not obvious. And then people eventually adopted it, and it changed everything. So um, my understanding is that it, uh, uh, without, this, without this linear amplification that we've got from uh, um, feedback, uh, the communication devices that were developed in the mid to late 1900s that sort of changed how we communicate in the world would have never been possible. So that's why Bell Labs telephone people were the ones that were inventing it first. OK. Uh, cool. So negative feedback. It's different than the feedback that people give me on. Of course, of course, feedback is always positive. Always positive feedback. So we can think of negative feedback as continuously adjusting the output such that equation 4.5 is approximately true, such that V plus is approximately equal to V minus. Consider the feedback of V out to the inverting input called unity feedback as shown in figure 410A. So that is this figure. For those of you who have the previous seven notes, it's just figure 410. Um, but it's, it's this figure. So what we're doing is we're putting in a, 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 an input voltage to the non-inverting input. And we're taking the output voltage and we're just connecting it to the inverting input. Okay? And uh, you can also connect it with elements in between, which we'll do in a moment. It's like in this case, we connected a resistor in between. Uh, but in this case, so you can put like a capacitor or whatever. But in this case, we're just going to feed it right back in. Output goes back into the inverting input. And then we're going to have it uh, go across a load Z. The output go across a load Z. So this circuit is what we're going to consider here. Um, so we're going to do some analysis on this. 
uh, when we do analysis of op-amp circuits, we're trying to, typically, we're trying to write the output voltage as a function of the input voltage, okay? That's telling us how, you know, we have control of the input, so we can control the input, and then we can get some output for it. So if you want to know what the output's going to be, you want to know it as a function of the input. So that's what we're aiming for here. So let's do some analysis. Um, so the, uh, the output equation can be transformed as follows. So we can go back to our original output equation. V out is equal to A times V plus minus V minus, which in the case of this unity feedback op-amp circuit, we said that V plus, remember we just connected the source to it, right? Which we said was V in. And uh, uh, minus V minus, which we just said, um, if we look at the circuit again, uh, we connected V minus to V out, right? So V minus is equal to V out. So we can write that there. And you can solve this for yeah, solve this for V out. Well, I'll write on the next line. V out is equal to uh, A divided by 1 plus A times V in. Since A is going to be much greater than 1, right? Uh, it's it's going to be like 100,000. Then this ratio is 100,000 divided by 100,000 and 1. And so we're left with a ratio of about 1 here, which tells us that the output voltage is pretty much equal to the input voltage. In other words, for negative unity feedback, V out follows V in. For this reason, this particular op-amp circuit is called a voltage follower, okay? This is still a useful circuit, and why is it, why is it useful? Why do you guys think that this circuit can still be useful? The input voltage could be a controlled voltage, like from the MyRio, it doesn't have much power behind it, right? But that output voltage, which will follow it, will have power behind it. It comes from your power supply to the op amp. So you're going to have a powerful plus minus 12 volt differential supply, for instance, or 24 volt differential supply, that you can use, uh, uh, you can control using an op amp just directly. It gives you the same voltage, but it gives you that voltage with an ability to drive a load that's, that requires power, that requires a lot of currents to flow. Whereas your small, uh, uh, say, MyRio or other microcontroller-based voltage doesn't have power behind it. Okay, so there's the voltage follower. Let's consider negative feedback's effect on the difference in input voltage. Okay, so we're exploring this to kind of like understand how feedback is affecting things. So V plus minus V minus is the difference in the input voltage. Um, that's just equal to V plus minus V out, right? Because we said V minus is just V out. And then V plus... Um, um, so, and then V out was just, we just solved for it, right? It was A over 1 plus A, or approximately 1, times V in, which V in, remember, was just V plus. So V plus minus, so, and I'm going to say approximately, because... 
to be plus minus 1 times v plus, which is equal to 0. Right? So, in other words, v plus is approximately equal to v minus. That is, for negative feedback, the input voltages are nearly equal. So, v plus is approximately equal to v minus. This is actually control theory. This is how we make a system behave the way we want. So, this is the very, very fundamental uh, 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 way of thinking about control theory. But if you want some variable to be what you want, you measure what it actually is, you feed it back to your system, you take the difference between what, uh, what you want it to be and what it is, and then you feed that forward back into the system. And that scheme of feedback can be used to control what the output is. So it's uh, 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 a topic that we're going to cover in detail next semester in system dynamics and control, the course. Um, but uh, for now, we can just recognize that it feedback's already doing cool stuff for <coughs> us. And um, for instance, it's keeping these two voltages close to each other. So, in this instance, the loop gain, the effective gain from V in to V out, so the loop gain is an important concept, so I don't want to like breeze past it without stopping and saying, see, I wrote it in green, that means it's important. <laughs> the loop gain, Uh, uh, the effective gain from V in to V out is 1. The same principle applies when elements such as resistors and capacitors are placed in the feedback path. The resulting loop gain can be non-unity and respond dynamically to the signal when you put those other elements in the feedback path. So um, we'll see uh, one more example of that, the non-inverting op-amp circuit where we put a resistor in the feedback path. But there are others where you put a capacitor in the feedback path, or an inductor in the feedback path, or some combination. And you can make the input-output behavior uh, uh, do all kinds of fun things, including like differentiating a signal, integrating a signal, summing two signals. You can do all of these things with uh, uh, different variations. So there's a... There's a um, there are a lot of really nice examples in the Art of Electronics uh, textbook. There are also a lot of good examples in, uh, uh, on Wikipedia for uh, op-amp circuits. So they're really well known and well understood. So when you're like, I want to amplify a signal, say you're making a measurement, like I want to amplify the signal, um, it's pretty easy to look up a simple op-amp circuit. This is actually a good one, uh, a non-inverting op-amp circuit for your measurement signal, for instance. So it's pretty, pretty nice. You can look up like, oh, okay, this configuration. And then you have to find out what the gain is going to be from input to output. Well, uh, uh, there, it usually boils down to something pretty simple. So we'll do an analysis of this one. And the, pre the gain, the open, or the, the loop gain for uh, the voltage follower, which is one, right? It's not very useful. Sounded like a warning. Amber alert. Amber alert. Oh, is that my Trump text? It's like a presidential. Oh, it happened. And now I'm getting a phone call. It's probably, it's probably Donald. He's calling me now. Uh. Oh, he didn't say anything. Damn. Okay. So. The, uh, the non-inverting op-amp op circuit. So it's shown in figure 410B. So let's look. Oh, it's up here. So this guy. Um, so we put a resistor in the feedback path, right? And we're taking as the output voltage, the voltage across these two resistors, R1 and R2. So we're going to do an analysis of the circuit and find what the 
loop gain is. This is like almost always what we're interested in. We're interested in if you put in x volts, how many times x do you get out on the other side? That's the loop, that's the loop gain. And so that's what we're interested to find in this circuit as well. So we'll do the analysis. And we'll talk about how you can do it in two ways. So you can use the original uh, uh, A times V plus minus V minus equation, or you can use the V plus is approximately equal to V minus approximation. They both give you the same result. One gives you more information than the other, and, and uh, uh, the one that gives you more information takes more work. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about, um, about that as we go. So. Let's do uh, um, some circuit analysis. We could, so I'm doing this in a sort of ad hoc way. So I'm, I'm going along and we're just taking, uh, I'm gonna march through equations and just like say, oh, okay, now we'll use KVL, now we'll use Ohm's law, and, and we'll do it that way. Or we can do it systematically like we've, like we've learned before. I'm gonna do it in a sort of ad hoc way here because the circuit's not, there's only three elements in it uh, besides the, the, the input voltage. So um, I'm going to kind of do it in an ad hoc way. But if you wanted to go back and write down your elemental equations and all that, uh, your elemental equation for the op amp would just be that V out is equal to A times V plus minus V minus. And that would be, uh, uh, and you would say that the current going into each of these terminals is zero. Those would be the, the, um, the, elemental equations you could write for this op um, But we're going to do it in a sort of ad hoc way and march through. Uh, either way is fine. So if we looked at the KVL expression for V out in terms of VR1 and VR2, so if we looked at V out, we see that, oh, this is just VR1 plus VR2, right? This little uh, uh, sort of imaginary loop that we could draw here. So um, we can write that V out is equal to VR1 plus VR2. And since we're solving for V out, I, we, I started with this. I mean, you might think, well, how did you come up with come, writing down KVL first? Well, I wanted, I wanted to start with V out because I want to solve for V out. And then I want to write the right-hand side in terms of Vn, if possible. So that's a justification for why I chose that. I'm going for, eventually, solving for V out in terms of Vn. And so I found an equation I could write V out directly, which was a good start. Right? So that's, that's my justification. I know that sometimes when you're first learning to analyze circuits, where are you going to start is, is a hard question. Um, so Starting by writing the thing that you need to solve for on one side of an equation is a great start, usually. <laughs> so that's where we started. And let's proceed by using Ohm's law. So these are just two resistors, R1 and R2. So we could write, we could, we could exchange VR1 for IR1 times R1, right? And the same with VR2. So let's do that. Let's use Ohm's law and write that V out is equal to IR1 times R1 plus IR2 times R2. Now let's use uh, uh, the KCL equation for the node between R1 and R2. So I have an equation that's got IR1 and IR2 in it. And if I look up here, I can relate those IR1 and IR2 by looking at the KCL equation for that node. So let's do that. We see that the current going into this node, IR1, is equal to the current going out of this node. But, but a question we might have is, what is I minus? Zero. Zero. It, the, remember, these inputs to the op amp draw zero current. So I can write uh, so I can write that IR1 so I, 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 I could just write it you know straight up 
node equation. IR1 minus IR2 minus I minus <laughs> equals zero. And then that this is just zero. So therefore, IR1 uh, is, is equal to IR2. IR1 equals IR2. OK. Um, so now we can write uh, this equation again with either IR1 or IR2. Um, we're going to choose IR2 um, because I happen to know that's a good direction to go with this. But if you chose the other one, you could still simplify down. It's just it would be a longer route. So I'm, uh, I'm choosing the one that I think is easier in this case. Um, so I'm going to write, instead of IR1 and IR2, I'm going to write in terms of IR2. So V out is going to be equal to IR2 times R1 plus R2. Okay. And um, we could solve that. So this is what one expression for V out. I, in a in a minute, I'm going to need to know. I, I want, I'm going to want to eliminate IR2. So let's just <coughs> preemptively solve this for IR2. Um, I know it's not motivated yet, but it's easy enough to do. It's just V out is it's just V out over R1 plus R2. Okay. So we can write another equation for V out from the op amp. So this is the point at which you have to decide, am I going to go with the, the simplified V plus is approximately equal to V minus approximation, or am I going to use the original op amp uh, uh, equation? So now so I'm going to go with the long uh, uh, route, which is to use A times V plus minus V minus. But recognize that right here, we could take a shortcut to the solution um, and do so or we could say V plus is approximately equal to V minus and we would get to our solution a little bit faster. I'm going to take the long route and then we're going to circle back and see that the short route is actually uh, uh, shorter. Yes, exactly. So, um, so we're going to start with this and we're going to say, okay, so V out, here's another expression for V out. We have two expressions um, that have V out in it. This one that we've solved for here and this one down here. Uh, we want to know V out in terms of V in and we can rewrite remember that V plus in this circuit is connected to V in, right? V plus and V in are the same. And V minus is VR2. Do you guys see that? So the voltage, so V minus, is the same voltage. All you know, voltage doesn't change along a a wire. So this is just V minus right there, which is the same as VR2. Remember, if you talk about the voltage at a point, you always implicitly mean relative to ground. So when you talk about V plus, you talk about V minus, you mean V plus relative to ground and V minus relative to ground. Okay? So when you talk about V minus and it happens to be at the same point here that drops across R2 to ground, that means that they're the same voltage. V minus is equal to VR2. So we can rewrite our equation as being V in minus VR2. Well, VR2 via Ohm's law can be rewritten in terms of IR2, right? So A times, oh, I wasn't going to do that till the next, the next line, right? So I'll, I'll leave that there. Now, so we have an expression for IR2 that can eliminate VR2 with a little Ohm's law action. So rewriting V out equals A times V in minus, using Ohm's law, VR2 is equal to IR2 times R2. 
and we can substitute now this expression in for IR2. I found that no matter, I mean, you can like number equations and say substituting this, but like an arrow is like better. I don't know why, but a weird sloppy arrow that goes across the whole page somehow conveys it better. <laughs> so uh, we have V minus, or VI minus um, this expression times R2. So I'm going to say minus, I'm going to bring the R2 out front, R2 over R1 plus R2 uh, times V out. And now we've got V out on both sides of the equation, right? So if we, or if we add this term to both sides, we get V out plus A R2 divided by R1 plus R2 times V out on this side equals A V in still on the right hand side which we can factor out the V out term and divide through what's left to solve for V out equals A divided by long expression uh, 1 plus a r2 divided by r1 plus r2 times v in. Okay. So I'm going to do uh, one more. So, so this is definitely the simplest way it could be written, or one of the simplest ways it could be written. I'm going to rewrite it in another way, which has a as a single term. Um, just to make the next point clear. Uh, uh, this is not simpler looking. I'm going to multiply the, the numerator and denominator of this expression by the reciprocal of this term. Okay? So I'm going to end up with, in the numerator, I'm going to end up with uh, R1 plus R2 divided by R2 divided by divided by uh, R1 plus R2 divided by R2A plus 1, so this continues out here, um, times Vn. So this has A in there only showing up once. So we see that if A is much, much greater than R1 plus R2 divided by R2, this term in the denominator goes to zero, right? And there's just a one left in the denominator. So the open loop gain, which is, the, which is this term, the, whatever you multiply V in by to get V out, uh, uh, the open loop gain becomes approximately R1 plus R2 divided by R2. So in other words, just the numerator survives. This gives the following input-output equation for the circuit. So you can just use that as the loop gain. So you can say that V out is approximately equal to R1 plus R2 divided by R2 times Vn. So the output voltage is going to be greater than the input voltage. This is true amplification, whereas our, our previous, uh, uh, we talked about how transformers, you can step up the voltage, um, but you drop the current, right? This one, you can actually increase the voltage and not drop the current, um, which is Nice. So this is true amplification. Yeah. So we've got this uh, uh, open loop. Oh, so we have this open loop gain that's huge, right? 100,000. A is 100,000. 
Uh, but the loop gain ends up being R1 plus R2 over R2. A doesn't even show up in it, which is actually really nice So for, for a couple reasons. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't depend on A. A can be variable. So A can vary from one op amp to the next op amp pretty significantly, even though they're the same manufacturer, same model. And it can also change with temperature. And A is not a very uh, uh, nice um, uh, gain to use. It's, it tends to be rather nonlinear, and also as soon as we when we use A to amplify something, it, it becomes nonlinear quickly because we saturate. So A is not great, but this amplification um, doesn't depend on A, which is good, uh, and it does depend on on two resistors, R1 and R2, and those are very reliable. Okay, so resistance is pretty stable. You can measure the resistance and uh, uh, very accurately, and, and it'll stay that resistance. Um, and your uh, uh, you can get high precision resist resistors too that you don't even need to measure because they're guaranteed within like one percent. Uh, so you can get a really nice gain um, from this that's that's very predictable and stable. Um, but remember, this this has to be true in order for that to hold. So, so you can use this result as long as A is much greater than this ratio. So, which is always going to be uh, uh, the case unless you make a, uh, a mistake in, in choosing R1 to be humongous compared to R2, in which case you can have some issues. Um, this uh, independence of the input-output relationship on the loop gain is very common for op-amp circuits. So by using feedback, we have essentially traded gain, because the gain is going to be, you know, it's got to be much less than A. So in some ways, you're kind of like, oh, that sucks. We lost so much gain. We had 100,000. Now our gain's only R1 plus R2 over R2. That's too bad. Uh, uh, but what we've done, we've traded some of gain. Um, and what we, we've gotten is better linearity and gain invariance, because when you operate with this in this feedback mode, you get good linearity because the, the output uh, gets fed back to the input and V plus and V minus don't get very far from each other. So you don't saturate. So you get linear operation and you get gain invariance. So it doesn't matter what A is, you can, you can still uh, uh, you can predict what your, uh, oh, uh, what your loop gain will be. So it can be shown that this is equivalent to the assumption that V plus is about V minus. Making this assumption earlier in the analysis can simplify the process. Um, note that we do not use the assumption for the op-amp equation V out is equal to A times V plus minus V minus, because this would simply imply that V out is zero. Instead, in the previous analysis, we can immediately assume that VR2 is V in and proceed in a similar fashion. So let's, let's look at that. So this is the point that I said, or we could have gone another route. Let's do that other route in the margin and see how easy that is, okay? So I kind of, uh, uh, I'll do it in this margin over here. So, or V plus is approximately equal to V minus. So instead of using this approximation, we can say V plus is about V minus. What does that tell us in terms of our circuit? If V plus is approximately V minus, that means that V in is effectively the same voltage that is along this wire and this wire over to here, right? So V in effectively is the same voltage that's across R2. So if VR2 is known to be V in, we can find its current easily. So okay, let's so let's let's write thing, thing down one at a time. So if we if we make this assumption, this implies that uh, uh, VR2 is equal or approximately equal to VN. And if you know that uh, uh, VR2 is just IR2 times R2, oops, 
then we can use our IR2 equation, substitute it in there, and we get that we get V out R2 divided by R1 plus R2 equals V in. But we want to solve for what V out is in terms of V in, so we say V out is equal to R1 plus R2 divided by R2 times V in. And you've found your loop gain like quite quickly, right? You didn't have to go through this whole A being much larger than this fraction, but you also didn't get to learn what the conditions were that made uh, 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 this approximation true. So you do need to be a, a little bit careful that um, when you do this analysis, you have to recognize when you make the assumption that V plus is approximately V minus, there's some sort of, there's some sort of limitation on it, A and your other components. And so that condition, you won't know if you just make this assumption. So going the long route gives you a limitation on the approximation. Uh, going this route is probably true, but you don't know when it's not going to be true. <laughs> so you kind of got to choose one or the other. Yeah? So for safe, that would just be the long route? The long route is, I would say, if you're designing a circuit from scratch and designing an amplifier, I would just go the long route. If you're doing a quick analysis on something that you know, like you just, if it just says find, if, if it's a problem in, in, a, in an exam, it says find the loop gain, the short route uh, is, is fine. If it says what are the, what are the limitations on uh, uh, how you can choose R1 and R2, or what are the limitations on your loop gain, what are the conditions for this being true, uh, you are going to need to go the long route. So it, it, it does depend on the situation a little bit. Okay, that's all I've got. Can you go back to the figure? Yeah. So I'm going to stop this for now.